Hi, everyone. Welcome to Turning Point. I'm your host, Blaine Birch, co-founder at Dry Run. And uh, joining me today is Kyle Friedman, co-founder and CEO at Quickly. Thanks for joining me today, Kyle. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so, Kyle, you and I talked, uh, we just met recently, like uh, we, I know we talked just a few weeks ago, probably for the first time. And uh, you're kind of in the in the neighborhood. We're, we're based in, in uh, Alberta as well, uh, just a little bit north of you guys. And um, but we haven't crossed paths yet, which is it was kind of interesting uh, for kind of a small province with entrepreneurs. Um, how did you get started as an entrepreneur? Um, well, it goes way back. Um, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit, um, started off, um, well, I, I grew up in New Brunswick and okay. growing up in New Brunswick, you kind of did anything you could to make money because there wasn't much work. Um, okay. so I, I started off, um, just kind of doing whatever I could, like carrying hay bales, um, doing wreaths and things for seasonal activities, clams. Yeah. Uh, but like always making money um, off of my own work. So I've had like a handful of small jobs, but um, I've really worked for myself my entire life. So that's uh, a very familiar story to a lot of um, a lot of people I talk with. They start uh, again. They're messing around doing things really literally as kids and little uh, schemes in school and high school and everything. Um, you know, myself, I think I had a job for about three years. And that was it. Yeah. And then, you know, on to on to my own. Uh, so what was your first like? So after you uh, like, I guess, what would, what would you cal- characterize as your first real endeavor, I suppose, after high school? Like, where did you sort of dive in first? Yeah. So I I dove into the music and entertainment industry. So I went to okay. school for audio engineering, music production, and okay. I would record bands and, and cut albums and do live you know, orchestral recordings and kind of all of this stuff. So I was working for myself, um, going to school, um, making music. And yep. um, the funny thing is, is that like when I was going to school to make music, um, the the real truth of it is uh, I, I was going to need an apartment. And um, basically I, I booked in to go see this apartment. It was like, 10 o'clock at night, it was completely odd that he wanted me to go there so late. And I got there and um, the guy was painting it. And um, and I was like, oh, that's a great place. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm painting. I was like, well, why are you working? He's like, oh, we are so busy. He's like, if you had a painting company, you could make a pile of money. And I was like, well, I have a painting company. Um, so <laughs> I did, anyway, I, I, I said what I had to. I had done some painting experience and different things because obviously growing up in New Brunswick, I did everything. Um, and um, yeah, the next day uh, he was like, well, that's that's all great. Um, but, you know, oddly enough, we're giving out all the contracts. This was Killam Properties. They're kind of like the boardwalk of the East. And um, you were giving out all the contracts. Fantastic. You're great. If, but you would have to have, you know, a, a company. You'd have to have a GST number, you, you have to be a legit organization uh, yeah. for us to give you this stuff. And it's all closing today. And I said, well, you know, could you give me the day to kind of put it together? Um, and they said yes. And that was a nine o'clock meeting, uh, 9 a.m. By noon, I had everything incorporated, everything built. And nice. they actually gave me uh, the painting contracts uh, to do all of the uh, rentals for Killam Properties. So I was in Fredericton, capital city, going to school for music and audio engineering, uh, recording albums uh, in the night, and then going to school, and then having all my friends work for me, painting these apartments uh, yeah. as people would move in and move out. And that was like the first um, dive into this entrepreneurial circuit of wearing a thousand hats, yeah. you know, signing yourself up for something that you didn't know how to do, and figuring <laughs> it out. Um, so yeah, so yeah. that that's where it went, and it and it grew and it grew. I um, I I was recording the albums. Then I realized, uh, you know, the educational system was not what it was cut out to be. Spent a lot of money, and the, everything was was on an analog basis, but it was a digital world. So I moved into uh, creating an online school for music production in 2011. It was like a Linda's or a, a master's class of gotcha. sorts. And uh, I scaled that up and uh, to a thousand users and still managed to fail. Um, <laughs> but 
yeah all in all having this little painting company on the side so it's um uh, you know i i i feel like like so many entrepreneurs i talk with and and myself included how much of what we do is just like it's opportunity like you just spot opportunity and you jump on it and and um i remember uh when i when i started my first business i just kind of quit my very first job and went well i'm just gonna do this and not a whole lot of thought ahead just gotta go get some clients and uh gotta make some money and so in the meantime i was um uh i had a friend ask well, well do you know flash can you can you come teach some courses yeah i know flash sure come teach some courses because this is back yeah. when flash was new right and yeah. And, uh, and I managed to go in and teach a course with a room full of people. And I had a, a book on the desk and I think I, I was like about two pages ahead of them the entire time, <laughs> <laughs> but I was good enough, good enough at BS and that it, I sounded like enough of an expert, even though I was like, literally, okay, well, what's next year. And, um, but you know, it, it sort of led down a path of, uh, um, a working, uh, like having a contract to, to work with a department there to just generate courses and income for them. And, uh, and eventually I was teaching a little bit at the university and just, it, it's all these little opportunities sprout out of these things. And I think it's just natural for an entrepreneur. You see that and it's like, yeah, I'm going after that. I think part of it, I wanted to bounce this off because one of the biggest challenges I think for an entrepreneur is, is, um, focus. And how do you say no? Because, you know, you have to be able to, to, to be able to say, I, I'm going down this path and this is what I'm going to focus on because otherwise you do like a thousand different things. Well, and I think that's naturally, so like um, an analogy, like what you were talking about, the entrepreneur is like, it's a person that's willing to build the ship while they're sailing it, to build the plane while they're flying it at the same time and be willing to, you know, crash or or fall flat on your face. And um, the the ability of, uh, or, to, to say no to things, I think really comes with time. Um, so, you know, cause what you say yes to says no to something else. And, um, I think Jim Collins was really, um, a, a, a good thought leader and good to grade on the flywheel analogy, right. Of, of one continual push in the same direction will gain enough momentum to eventually, you know, surpass your competition. So I, I would say like, I was the same as everybody else. And I think I, I have been, uh, throughout the years, it, it took a long time to say no to things because you just get distracted by these shiny objects that could be the biggest thing in the world. And you naturally want to do them because you can do anything and you can figure it out. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, the true catalyst to success is like sticking to something like anything. And, and being able to really um, continue on in, in a single direction because it really takes time um, yeah. to be successful, like twice as long as you think, if not longer. Um, and you got to learn and iterate on everything, right? So, yeah, it's. I, I remember at one time, oh man, back in the early two thousands, I was um, I was teaching senior level courses at the university. I had a. a, a a business. I got a creative agency. I had a bunch of people sitting there. Um, I was doing my master's degree. I was uh, still doing some consulting, like way and on a couple of boards. I forgot about that too. And um, uh, it was ridiculous. And one of the things that I, that I learned the hard way is that it, it was mentally straining way too overwhelming. And you can only go so far on, um, firing on like uh, on all cylinders like it's just it was this you're you're in a, in, in a permanent state of almost panic right like there's just there's you don't think yeah. it's panic you think you're just like it's hey, going right um and and i think one of the biggest things that that uh was important for me like it was le- uh, lesson learned the incredibly hard way uh was to just start cutting that off cutting that off cutting that off cutting that off and getting down to to um now you say one thing, but it's never one thing. But getting it down to yeah. a, a way more reasonable number of things, right? And 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 a one that's a really strong focus. And um, you know, I, I I remember hearing people always say, "Well, it takes five years to build a business, like minimum, right?" And my agency, yeah. I remember, like we got our first contract, and you're like, "Yeah, we're profitable right out of the gate," which is totally different than <laughs> building yeah. something like I'm building now. It's completely different. And you're like, nah, it doesn't take that long. Look, at it. we got it like first weekend. Um, 
And then five years later, I look back and go, oh, yeah, no, we did. We have a real business now. We, we didn't then. Yeah. We, like, not a real business, but systems, processes, it's got big enough to be kind of scary because it's like we got to make a lot of money every bloody week just to keep our doors open. Kind of creeps up on you, right? Um, yeah. But I, I think you're probably in the sort of the, the, the place where I'm at now. Like, we're building a business that's very different. It's like we have to build the business first. You got to build the product first. You got to build that demand first. And then you got to build the revenue up, 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 which is so different from the service business where it's like, yeah, signed on the dotted line. We got a contract. Let's go. Super challenging, super lumpy sales and everything. But looking back, it was a lot easier, a lot easier. Yeah. the And I think that's also too, like the difference between, you know, well, a bit of bootstrapping um, and, you know, a, a, a bit of, uh, you know, equity or, or cash injection kind of in that building phase. Cause the businesses that I built, like the, the first one, this uh, online school for music production, like we scaled it to a thousand users at 10 bucks a month. We still managed to crash and burn because we were just bootstrapping it. We were trying to build it while we were working, you know, we got hacked, we had all these things and it wasn't necessarily like the right, business philosophy or style for um tech um yeah. but but that applied really well when uh, after that i moved into i i've kind of done like all sorts of stuff moved into construction and the insurance industry and um you know we could build the ship as we were going and then now i've kind of made it full circle back uh throughout this to uh to the tech industry again and it seems like uh i've, I've learned my lessons and done a better job so yeah, I, I I feel like uh, a little bit with Dry Run, we we learned our lesson with within Dry Run. Like we just hung in long enough <laughs> to learn yeah. enough. Like, you know, we started out bootstrapped. We um, then we took a little bit of cash in. Um, and uh, but I think, you know, I look back and I'm like, should we have taken more money earlier? Like, I don't know, because back, you know, a few years ago, the whole thing was burn through your cash fast and yeah. grow fast grow fast grow fast and and the the philosophy is grow fast will make sense if you do it the perfect uh perfectly the first time that doesn't happen very often that's why 90 percent of these startups fail by their whatever their their 10th year or actually with startups like tech startups I think it's even sooner now yeah um that's part of the problem i think like and you know just even even the way that investors viewed uh startups was just that the fail fast. See, fail fast to me is fail fast on small failures to learn to move forward. Yeah. I kind of think they look at, they, they kind of say that, but I think it's kind of to them as like, yeah, fail fast. Cause I got the next, I, then I know I don't have to put more money into you and we've got a bunch <laughs> of others down on the, on the, you know, on the list. And for us, it feels like there's so many failures along the way that we've learned from. And it's just, you know, we, we, just hung in there and hung in there and hung in there until you go, I think we kind of got it now. Right. Um, and, um, I don't know. I like, I still look back and go, I don't know. Like, did we do it right by basically mostly bootstrapping a little bit of money here? Some not non dilutive there. Um, would we be way further ahead if we took money in or dead? And I really yeah, don't and, know. And that's it. Like, it's like the, these tech has a ton of pressures to kind of, build quickly um as you're saying and um it can just be a, a race to dilute it can be a race yeah. to um kind of run out of capital and i think that like i really take the approach of shoot bullets launch cannons right so mm. um place Excellent. small bets yeah take a yeah. scientific approach test your assumptions so mm. a lean a lean startup outlook and and then once I have more uh, assurance and more understanding of it, then my bet gets slightly bigger. And we took that approach too. So we, we bootstrapped for the first little bit, then we did a raise uh, on quickly. Then we you know, saw um, success, right? So we did the raise, then we spent very conservatively, got to the next step, saw success, raised again, you know, did non-dilutive uh, throughout it. So. I'm I'm in the same point um, or the same uh, thought process. Like I, I, I don't. I think naturally there's just a lot of pressures to move 
so quick in this space. And that like to navigate that as a CEO or a founder, like you really have to like step back and be like, where's this pressure coming from? Like, am I just like reading the news and seeing, you know, this company exited for this amount or this company raised this and comparing myself? We're like completely different businesses, completely yeah. different circumstances, completely different opportunities, completely different geographical locations or uh, yeah. whatever it might be. But like naturally, you know, it's like, oh, you've got a great idea. You're doing great. Here's some money. Now let's, let's, let's take over the world. And it's like, well, yeah, that, that's great to an extent. But I mean, I, I got to build an actual good, solid foundational business that makes sense on a, on a unit economic perspective and that I like feel comfortable. And yeah. uh, I find it's, it's really easy to get caught up in that pressure. So it, it's so easy. And, and it felt like, um, like the, the whole mantra was blitz scale till like six months ago. And then all of a sudden the startup or the, the investor community decided to coin a new phrase called default alive, which um, I, I was, you know, as, as being kind of a, a finance app here, I'm like, you can say break even. You can, in fact, yeah. you can say profit. There is nothing wrong with profit, but I think they spent so many years um, saying it was a dirty word that they just tried to, you know, bait and switch people with a new term. Um, but I'm more comfortable with the idea of build a smart company, build one that's profitable, um, and grow off of that. And, uh, because like we, we've made a, a, you know, a, a, a fairly big change in our, in our focus on our sales focus in the last number of months. And, you know, we, with the, the sort of the thesis we had and the, the target we were going after, it made perfect sense, it made perfect sense to us, made perfect sense to our advisors, to our investors, to like, uh, accelerators that were grabbing us. And, and, uh, you know, and, but in reality, it didn't quite play out. We grew, but we started to see cracks going, well, we're not going to be able to grow fast enough. It's going to be too hard. And meanwhile, we're seeing success over here. And I think if we had, um, much more invested and much more pressure, maybe we would have kept like actually died or maybe yeah. we would have, the pressure would be so heavy to keep going on this original thesis where instead we went, no, you know what? It's over here. That's where every one of our users are wildly successful. We have to double down over here. And we didn't have as much of that massive pressure because, um, because we were kind of lugging it out a lot of it ourselves. And I think that was a gift. Like it's hard, but yeah. it's hard for everybody, right? It, it, it totally is. And I think the, the funny thing about like, like bringing this back to kind of our experience was we almost were like overlooked for the last two years because we were like unit economics, we're a FinTech, transactionally making sense, build this smart, like building foundational blocks, profiting, like we're, we're only at like seven employees right now. Like, yeah. you know, we, that that's not a lot. And we've transacted like $6 million through the platform. Nice. Um, and, uh, but we were like, okay, no, we're like going to make really sure. And then now this whole shift has changed where it's like, oh, you're building like a, a break even business or a, <laughs> a, a business that can move into profitability or, and has, and is growing continually. It's like, oh yeah, that's what makes sense. And it's like, yeah it is what makes sense. But like, why did you tell us for the last, you know, 18 months that, you know, we're a Passover. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and they were doing that like that. That's been the mantra for probably a decade. Yeah. And then it just suddenly switched and it's, um, and you know, like you, you mentioned it too, is it, one of the hardest things is seeing other startups. And of course, everybody from the outside looks wildly successful, right? Yeah. Yeah. And everybody else is doing, you know, 10 times more and everybody and you're like, oh, man, oh, man, you know, that's how, you know, are we, you know it, it just makes you question yourself and it shouldn't. Right. And um, a few things that just good reminders uh, over the last couple of months, um, I was talking with a friend of mine and, and they exited and they did a really uh, a really solid exit a couple of years ago. And we were talking and, and we, th there's a couple other companies in, 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 in their space that, you know, I was familiar enough with her name or whatever. And, and, um, I was found out that two of the exits that looked great on, on, on paper and in the news were rescues. 
and the founders were not getting uh, virtually anything out of it. And and again, it's like, oh man, that is brutal. It didn't look like that from the outside because nobody wants it to look like that. But then you kind of go, oh, thanks goodness that we have, you know, kept our powder dry and have been careful, right? And yeah. um, then the other one was, uh, like, I had a, a creative agency for over a decade, and, and we were doing a case study with one of our, our uh, customers a few, maybe about a month ago. And I don't know if it made it in the final video or not, I can't remember, but he was talking about, um, uh, he said, like, look, I, he goes, we've we've done some dumb things. And he said, we've, we just are always trying to, you know, manage our cash flow. And he said, really, like we've cut it close, dry run has saved our bacon. We've, but now it's religious. We're on top of it all the time and it's hard. And then he said, um, he said, yeah, but he goes, the thing is when I look back over the last 10 years, he said, all these other agencies that were super shiny and looked terrific and everything, he says, they're all gone. And it reminded me back to the days that when I had that agency and same thing, you would see like we had a nice place to work and we had an amazing team. We had really cool clients and then we had some that were hard, (laughs) quite frankly, but you'd see these other ones that were in like bigger offices and shinier and like all that kind of stuff. And um, it was interesting because I looked back and when he mentioned that and I said, yeah, you know, over those years, five, six, seven of those in Alberta disappeared in the time that we just kept on going. And all of a sudden they were gone, just gone. And, um, it's just a good reminder that it's like, just, you just focus, you gotta, you gotta block that stuff out and focus on, uh, your success and, and try and not worry about that. Right. Cause the pressure is there, right? The pressure to succeed is there. And uh, like, I honestly, I, I have been in that position. The, so, after I um, exited out of, uh, so 2014, I went into the insurance restoration, exited in 2016, and uh, I had this little painting company, right? So I, I talked about it. It yeah. got the friends working, had it. That thing just chugged along uh, yeah. on the side. And uh, by 2016, I was like, wow, like this thing is just living on its own, making money. I was like, okay. I've, you know, I've, I've got some cash now. What am I going to do? And I was like, Maybe I'm just going to put my energy into this, right? So, like, focus on one thing, not all this other stuff. You know, it wasn't cool, but I'm going to do it. And um, I made it something really cool. And when I put my head down and focused into that one, you know, the success was was correlated. And um, mm-hmm. I grew that company in the spotlight um, by from 2016. By 2019, we were the 86th fast-growing company in Canada. We were... Um, winning like the growth 500, the global mail 400, like placing on that, the one that business leaders of Calgary, like where I'm going with this is you get all these accolades, but on the inside, what was really going on was like this, like high growth engine doubling annually, tripling some years that was just like cash strapped and like stressful because like you're at the mercy of clients that aren't paying, right? You've yep. got these ambitions and growing, you're investing all of your profits into this thing. And like where I'm going with it is like, it looked amazing. I bet to other people They're, like, I still yep. get compliments and stuff. And it's like, wow, what, look at what you did and uh, all of this spotlight and attention. And it's like, well, on the inside, like it, it, like it was fun, but it sucked. Um, yep. Like, and was difficult. And like, that was the basis of why, you know, I started um, quickly, like my newest company, because like you could grow something so successfully and yet still be so challenged by yeah. cash flow. Like it's it's odd that we're, you know, both yeah. companies, we understand it. Um, and yeah. I was like, like, I, I just want to solve this once and for all for people because it's like, it's not, it's not right. So yeah, so I, yeah. I get what it's like. I've been on the side of people maybe looking, I've been on the side here with quickly looking at the other ones and comparing myself. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a wild ride. So it's yeah. And like, I, like, you know, the, the formative time for me in cash flow was 2009. That's when like 2008, kind of the recession sort of started, but we got hit because we had a lot of uh, government contracts. 2009 is when those budgets slammed shut. Yeah. And you learn about cash flow and, and um, my, my, uh, I'm on another podcast, Mike and Blaine. 
Um, so if you want to check it out, but we talk a lot yeah. about cash flow because Mike was a, a founder years ago at, at Cashflow Tool, and, and they literally call him Cashflow Mike because that's what he does now. Is he just does consulting and 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 training and things. Um, but he always talks about this hotel staffing business he had, and the same thing. He goes, "I was strapped for cash," and he literally opened restaurants because they were cash businesses to fuel his hotel staffing business to ensure he could get cash moving through. And it's, it's, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger trying to solve problems. And, you know, my agency days, the one thing I'm like, okay, we, we, we stuck with kind of being an agency, but I still remember like when I, when I kind of quit my first job and I was out on my own, I got my first contract. And then, and I'm like, you look back five, six years later and you're like, well, yeah, making a, a little more money, like you know, because I was actually paying myself fine when I was doing it on my own. But suddenly, I I'm putting through like I have to sell, and not just sell, but get the cash in every single week. That was close to just like what I was probably paying myself a few years before. Yeah, and the pressure is so much. Like you start looking, going, oh my god, the pressure is immense. Because now I have to feed everybody else in the office, and um, and I'm not taking much more home. Like I was more, but not like not what you think. You're not pulling in millions of dollars, right? You're just like, and then yeah. when you're short on payroll, uh, you know, short on cash because some owes someone owes you a hundred grand. Guess who's cutting the check? You know, it's yeah. like hmm, I guess it's me. There's no one lined up behind you, and that actually. I want to segue a little bit into what you're doing now because that is that you brought that up. That's exactly what you help companies with, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Like my my biggest challenge in the businesses that I built before was cash flow, and literally boot like strapped by you know the a, a person that's paying net payment terms is like the big hairy audacious goal I went out to to solve. Um, it, things should be paid for when a service is rendered, not at a future date. Yeah. I can't change that one, so I build quickly. And um, what we do is we we pay people um, at a specific date. So I built a software that allows people to create an invoice, upload it, send it to a counterparty. Once they approve it, then that invoice, they can be paid immediately um, yeah. on it. And then we pull the repayment through the platform from their client. And um, what it's done is like, it's, almost taken shackles off of businesses like yeah. we uh like a, a actual customer comes on they put two ten thousand through the platform month one month two it's twelve thousand then like something clicks like they're they're um you know in their business then it's it's thirty thousand on month three and sixty thousand on month four and then we're like phoning them we're like what's going on um and they're like well like i can hire all these people i can like uh, buy equipment i can invest into technology or whatever it is like i can finally breathe and i can actually price accordingly for the cost of this service yeah. so that i can just be paid you know instantly as i'm doing my work and yeah, it, yeah so it uh yeah it's uh it's been pretty wild so yeah it's amazing what what you can do with cash because i think it's somewhere around like half the invoices are are paid late i don't remember the exact stats but it's around there yeah it's and uh, your average invoice time is 45 days right uh for payment so just like think about that and that's a spread of like 15 to 120 right that's like making that up so yeah 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 and it's it's you're you're betting your your life on getting paid right you're betting that um and it's amazing what you can do when you have cash come in and like we we're always looking at um, there, there's a, there's two places where we help companies and one is on the cash flow side. So you can help forecast and go, okay, what is your cash? What's actually happening there? When are you going to get paid? When do you expect to get paid? Um, the ideal thing is if we can, they can be more concrete because it's like, they know they're getting paid because it's still lumpy. It's still yeah. bouncy. Right. But they can tell, you know, be rest assured that, okay, I've got this money coming in. And then the second one is the lumpiness in the sales cycle. Because almost all the companies we deal with are just like we were. You're, you're, you know, when you're busy, you think it's never going to end, so you're not doing sales, and then inevitably, guess what? We got no sales. 
we help them predict that so that it's just that reminder, you better get out and sell or you're going to be overwhelmed in June. Let's smooth that out. Um, because that's the big challenge is it's this cash flow and it's the sales that turn into cash. It's all lumpy. You somehow have to smooth that out and keep that engine going. Otherwise, you're leaving a ton of money on the table and literally could just run run short of cash at the, at the worst time. Yeah. And I mean, you can do all the planning and, and you can start seeing um, kind of the, the smoothness of, of expectations. And then still somebody just doesn't pay or they just don't follow their normal payment habit or, you know, the submission was incorrect or whatever it is as it goes through. And then it just throws a wrench in it. And then payroll comes and we're the owners, we're on the hook. And uh, yeah, and then it's like, okay, well, you know, how is this my problem? Like I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing a really good job, but now I'm at the mercy of literally the people I work for when I've already done the work, um, it, it's wild. I remember talking with the CFO, oh man, this is uh, pre-COVID, so we're probably talking four years ago, something like that. And and we met for a drink, we were chatting, and he, he was ta- ta- telling me about um, a business that he had run into, and there are a couple of guys that were doing, and I can't for the life remember, I think it was some sort of oil field something. I can't remember what it was. But he said they were doing... I think it was two and a half, three million in business. And it was almost right out of the gate. But he said they were not very experienced. They're experienced what the, their, their, whatever it was, their service or probably, I can't remember what it was, but experienced there. And he said they were wildly profitable. Like they were smart enough. They had built in a massive amount of profit and they ended up selling their, their business. Basically he said 10 cents on the dollar because they didn't know about factory. So they yeah. couldn't get paid. They literally couldn't get paid and everything on paper was tons of money, wildly profitable, and they literally had to give away their business and all they needed. They didn't talk to the right people. All they needed to know was somebody to say factoring and they would still have their business today and be be killing it. And um, uh, but that's the nature of, of so many uh, entrepreneurs going to business as domain experts and they just don't know this. They learn it over time. They learn it the hard way. And that's probably why it's like takes that five years to really feel like you've got that business established because you have to learn. Um, like I always say, like I got my my MBA of hard knocks in 2009. You know, I learned yeah. operational finance and, and, and sales forecasting, sales pipeline, everything out of desperation to save a business and then found out, oh, this works, you know, yeah. and it's hard. I, uh, I always say like, uh, you know, failure for an entrepreneur is just education and education costs money. So yeah, yeah it, it's, uh, that's, that's sadly the way, the way it is. But yeah, the, the other thing with that is like, there's literally no blueprint. Like there's no like book on how to run your business because you came up with it, right? So yeah. like you can read all the books you want, find all these parallels and all these things, but yeah, it is going to take you some time to find out the nuances of your industry, the nuances of your business, build your processes, build everything. Um, yeah. And and you got to make it through, right? So, and you got to make it through all those mistakes. And that's really like where we can help is, is yeah. giving people that foundation and that expectation on when they're going to be paid, putting it into their control so they can just focus on the business and not spend all that energy waiting up at night, wondering if they're going to hit payroll, um, having to contact or call clients or that uncomfortable feeling of just asking to be paid on time, um, which is a funny thing that you have to do in business is I have to ask to be paid when it's late. I have to ask to be paid um, when it's on time and then forget about asking to be paid early. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. And and that, that, that uh, feels like, uh, um, now you're dealing with client relationships and everything else is this tied into that. And um, I just look back and think like, what could we have done if like, how much more confident would we have been if we just knew the money was coming in? Like you're literally yeah. always forecasting when we expect to be paid, when we expect to be paid. When we, and, and, and a lot of it was like, these guys are going to be late. These guys are going to be late. We think it's coming then. We think it's coming then. How much more could we have done if it's like at least the work we've done, we've invoiced, we know we've got money already for it. And 
I know one of our one of our customers talks about um, one of the biggest benefits of of like like he's talking about dry run, but it's just of being able to look into the future and know what's happening with your cash is being able to turn down bad jobs. And he yeah. talks about that ability to go. He's like, because you you need that money, which means you're taking a bad job, and the bad job leads to more bad jobs, and then you have to expand to serve all the bad jobs. Meanwhile, you've got some good jobs and good clients, but you're not really serving them the way you should. And he talks about it being a spiral down. And he said, like, if you know you have cash, you know you can turn down bad jobs and you can keep digging to find those good ones because the good ones lead to more good ones and it's a spiral up. And he literally says, he goes, I've never made more money for less work than I do right now because he goes, it all comes down to cash. Every bit of it comes down to cash. And, um, uh, like I look at, um, and exactly what you said is a service like yours can be completely business changing and you can build it into your pricing. Yeah. And, and that's, right that's it. Like, cause you can always engineer profit, but the yeah. ability to, um, navigate cash flow or, um, revenue or, or the, the, the other items. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, you, you can always build it in. And and that's what we yeah. see people doing. And that's kind of the smartest thing too, is as you understand your business, your costs of doing business, then you're continually adjusting and then things get smooth. So yeah, yeah. And that's like we, uh, um, like our customers are our established businesses, like they're, uh, um, they're multi-million dollar businesses, they've likely been around minimum five years or more. Um, and the lumpiness they face is so dramatic. Um, but the only way to be able to smooth that out, like you, you, you have to have this concrete cash and you have to be able to look forward and have the confidence and understanding where you're going. And, and we always say moving from the science to the art, if you have the information yeah. and you know, the cash is in there, now I can do sales and now I can negotiate. Um, and you, you can't really do that when, when you're blind. Right. Um, and what, what's interesting is it, it doesn't smooth out the bigger the company gets the peaks and valleys get larger. That's, that's what I was going to say. So like thinking about that too, is like, okay, well, if somebody was listening to this and they were like, okay, would, would I be able to use quickly or would this be something for me? Well, it's like the varying range of cash flow problems is like, yeah, it doesn't matter if you're big or if you're small. Like we see companies that are doing a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, or 200,000, which is categorized as like a micro small business, you know, one, maybe up to four employees. So you're ranging up. And then we see companies as big as like 75 million to 100 million that are having the same problems. It can yeah. be, you know, industry uh, specific. It could be all sorts of, of different things that are potentially out of your hands. Um, mm-hmm. And um, yeah, there, there really is no getting away from it um, until you learn, you know, what you say yes to says no to something else. You know, revenue is, is uh, vanity, profit is sanity, cash is king. Right. So you got to you got to bank that cash um, and have it. And then you got to learn who to say no to, because when you're offering a service or you're doing business for payment later, you are extending credit. And rarely does anyone look at the counterparty that they're extending credit to. And that's like uh, that's effectively what we do um, for them. And then we can help educate, too, where it's like, well, if you're not a quickly approved counterparty you probably don't want to work with them or you might want to get paid up front so yeah yeah (laughs) yeah it's it's um uh you can't imagine how many times i've heard um you know business owners say it's just another zero and then when you get up to bigger businesses now you're talking with the cfo and i've literally had them say it's just another zero like yeah it's the same problem and it just it just is magnified um immensely and and um like we we ran, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned on the show before, but I, I think you'd find this really interesting. We ran an algorithm a few weeks ago so we could give some sort of benchmarks to our to our, our users. Um, like how lumpy is, is there, are there sales and cash flow and, and, and how much should they be trying to smooth it out? And so we, we ran an algorithm. I just asked my co-founder, I said, Tark, just, I want to give them something logical, not whatever. I said, just tell me, um, if you did an average of your top four months, just the average of those top four months, the rest of the year, how much more money would you make? 
I was betting on 20 some percent, 63. Wow. And we got a lot, a lot, a lot of data points in dry run. Uh, like we have millions of transactions in there. And, and, our, and our customers are all that type, invoice-based lumpy, right? But we were still honestly completely shocked to the point where um, I said, you got to give me a data dump of like uh, over 100, 100 lines, 12 months. I just got to see this because it doesn't seem accurate. And then I did it in a, a spreadsheet just with this raw data, 63%. It was to the exact percent with my, I'm like, okay, this is just what it is. So, um, you know, Jeremy, who works for me, uh, my director of, uh, director of development, he just goes, so what you're telling me is you could half-ass your way to a couple hundred grand. <laughs> okay, we don't think we'll make that our new phrase, you know, tagline, but literally you could. And the, 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 the way you can do that is when you know you have cash. If you know you have cash and you can also see the peaks and valleys and you're, 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 you, you know what you're heading into, now you can say, okay, I've got a valley two, three months out. I need some quick turnaround sales and I got to go out and get them. And if I'm going to be overwhelmed in June, July, it's early enough I can negotiate and I can start maybe one early, start maybe one late. It doesn't take that much to smooth that out and you make a lot more money, but it still comes down to cash. And and um, what I love about you guys, what the service you offer is we can show them when they're likely to get that cash in, but there's always these mysteries of you got to stay on top of your customers and you got to keep updating dry room. When do you think that cash is going to come in? And it's just one more big step forward on that confidence of where you're going. If it's like, I, I can take that out of the equation. I know I send out an invoice and I have cash instantly. That, that can be um, a life changer for business and especially the type that we work with because they do have that lumpiness. Yeah. Well, we would love to, we'd love to help your customers and, and definitely. Yeah. I think there, there's, um, it, it's, it's, it's always gratifying when I talk with someone that, that is just understands the impact of, of cash flow. And it's because you, you, you know, I, I'll talk to people like I was just at South by Southwest, just got back a couple of days ago yeah. and talked to, you know, you're networking with like hundreds of people and, and you could, you could just tell when you're, when you're talking with someone and you just literally like the word cash flow and you either get kind of a blank stare and kind of, eh, I don't really get it and kind of, or you get like a visceral reaction. Yeah. And as soon as you get a visceral reaction, like, or, you know, they just, their eyes light up and like, yeah, they know what it is. They know the pain. They felt the pain. Um, it's such a, an amazing thing. And it's, it's nice to see um, others kind of in our little, in our little club trying to go, there's, um, you know, what a mi hundred million businesses out there. They're all going to have cash flow problems. How can we help? our sliver, our segment that we can help and, and help them get over the hump. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's amazing what you're doing. So um, working at it from a different angle, but it's, it's, it's what keeps you up at night. This is the one I want to solve. Yeah, it absolutely is. And um, well, I guess we're coming up, uh, we've been talking for quite a while here, coming up on, a, on our time here. I'll let you, I should let you get on with the rest of your day, but uh, I do want to um, uh, just make sure everybody knows how do they find you and how do they engage with you? And I know you talked a little bit about your service, but like how exactly does it work again and how can they yeah. get to you? Yeah. So you can find us at helloquickly.com. Um, check us out, uh, go there and then you can sign up uh, very easily, a uh, couple minutes or less. So sign up, join the app, try it out, see what you think. Um, what it is, is it gives you the ability to either create a new invoice um, and send it to anyone. Um, when you send it to them, they can pay through the platform um, or they can approve it. And then any approved invoice uh, is an invoice that you're allowed to be paid instantly. So we make it so you can get paid instantly on an approved invoice. We uh, are partnering in with, with lots of large organizations so that it can just be a tool for all of their vendors and service providers to be submitting their invoices and having them paid. Um, so you might see quickly coming to you in your business, uh, or you can find it um, on your own. And um, again, yeah, it's, it's just a super easy tool to sign up. There's no subscription fees. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a real lifesaver. 
for a business. That's uh, that's terrific, and I, I encourage all you guys out there to to go check out Kyle at uh, Talk with Kyle quickly. Um, HelloQuickly.com, though. Uh, that's how you'll find them. And um, uh, because I know how much impact the, this can have on businesses. And, um, and uh, you know, thanks again, Cal, for joining me. I, I did want to say to everybody out there, again, um, I'm, I'm uh, with Dry Run. Uh, we help uh, businesses forecast their sales and costs, figure out exactly what we're talking about. What does your near-term cash flow look like? And then we'll also help you peek out a little bit further and see the peaks and valleys next six, 12 months in your sales pipeline and um, make sure you can smooth that out and, and uh, um, just get things really moving and get to that spiral up like uh, like our customer guy talks about where you're getting better and better clients and you're, you're generating more and more income. Um, thanks so much for joining me, Kyle. I really, it was just terrific chatting with you today and um, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.